uh, because as I said, this is a little bit more technical. I want to spend some time on it, make sure you all understand it. Uh, and then um, I will uh, come back to this on Monday. What I want to do now is just to give you a little bit of a history of option pricing, because it's kind of fun. First of all, in order to, to figure out how to price options, we have to begin with figuring out what a particular model would be for the underlying stock. In order to price an option, you actually have to say something about how the underlying security behaves. All right? So we have to start with that. And we're going to start. Uh, in the very early 16th century with probably the first known model for asset prices that ever existed in, uh, in the world. And that was developed by an Italian mathematician by the name of Girolamo Cardano. Now, those of you who are on high school math team, I suspect you've heard of Cardano. Anybody tell me who Cardano was? No, uh, no math team geeks here? All right, Cardano was, it turns out, the second person to have come up with a solution for the cubic equation. You, you all know what the quadratic equation is, right? You know, uh, x squared plus uh, ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. That's a quadratic equation. Anybody know what the solution of that is? Yeah, what is that? <laughs> Great. All right, you, you get the pocket protector award. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> it turns out that there is exactly the same kind of solution for the cubic equation. Of course, nobody remembers that. I won't ask you whether you know that. You, you might. But, but there's a formula for the cubic equation. It turns out that there are no more formulas beyond the cubic. So there's something very special about the cubic equation. And this Italian mathematician, Cardano, was the first to publish it. The reason I say that he's the second person to come up with it is that it turns out he stole the formula from a colleague. And a colleague who had actually come up with the solution, and Cardano had heard about it and said, well, please tell me what it is. And the other person said, I'm not going to tell you what it is, because you're going to just write it up and claim credit. And Cardano says, no, no, I promise I won't. And then the guy says, all right, here, here it is. He told him. And then Cardano, in fact, did rip him off. And uh, <laughs> so it's known as Cardano's formula, but it really shouldn't. And uh, I'm embarrassed to say I don't remember the guy who actually invented it. <laughs> so, uh, but, but Cardano, in addition to having come up with this solution, uh, or stolen this solution, uh, Cardano also wrote a book on gambling. And uh, this book, which is titled Liber de Ludo Alea, The Laws of Gambling, he, he developed what was the precursor to the modern mathematical description of stock prices. And it was described in this way. The most fundamental principle of all in gambling is simply equal conditions, e.g. of opponents, of bystanders, of money, of situation, of the dice box, and the die itself. To the extent to which you depart from that equality, if it is in your opponent's favor, you are a fool. And if in your own, you are unjust. It turns out that what he was describing was essentially a 50-50 bet, or what we call a fair game, or what is now known as a martingale. A martingale simply says that expected winnings and losses uh, is equal to 0, or rather, your expected wealth next period is equal to whatever your wealth is today if you have a fair game uh, that you're betting uh, on. Right? It turns out that that simple model developed into what we now think of as the random walk hypothesis. And the random walk was really the fundamental driver behind the option pricing model that Black and Scholes and Merton developed. Now, the reason the random walk holds a very special place in the hearts of financial economists is because most economists suffer from a psychological disorder that uh, we call physics envy. You know, we all wish that we had these three laws that explains 99% of all behavior. In fact, economists have 99 laws that explain maybe 3% of economic <laughs> behavior. But there's one example, only one, in the history of finance where an economist actually came up with an idea before a physicist. And that was later adopted by a physicist. And the idea I'm talking about is the random walk hypothesis, or in the continuous time realm, Brownian motion. In 1900, a student by the name of Louis Bachelier was writing a dissertation uh, in Paris, uh, working with a, uh, he was a mathematics PhD student, but he was writing about pricing warrants that were trading on the Paris Bourse. So it was a finance thesis. And, uh, 
in order to, to solve the problem, he had to come up with a mathematical description for the underlying price. And he came up with this notion of what we now call Brownian motion, or random walk. And he did it a full three years before a well-known physicist published a paper on that. Anybody know who that physicist was? No, no. This is a, <laughs> Brown was many years before. He was a biologist. Yeah. That's right. Albert Einstein, in 1903, actually published a paper on the photoelectric effect and Brownian motion. And uh, if you take a look at uh, what Bachelier did, he was working with uh, the French mathematician by the name of uh, Henri Poincaré. Poincaré was a very well-known mathematician who uh, was the advisor to, to uh, Bachelier and uh, who is renowned now for a variety of different contributions, including the theory of dynamical systems. Bachelier wrote this thesis and developed the mathematics of Brownian motion. Uh, and when he was looking for a job, Poincaré wrote a letter of recommendation. And this is what Poincaré wrote about Bachelier. He said that uh, the manner in which the candidate obtains the law of Gauss is most original, and all the more interesting as the same reasoning might, with a few changes, be extended to the theory of errors. He develops this in a chapter which might at first seem strange, for he titles it Radiation of Probability. In effect, the author resorts to a comparison with the analytical theory of the propagation of heat. Now remember, this was a thesis on pricing warrants on the Paris Bourse. Fourier's reasoning is applicable almost without change to this problem, which is so different from that for which it had been created. And of course, his advisor at the end always has to complain a little bit about his student, as we all do. So he said, uh, it is regrettable that the author did not develop this part of his thesis further. What what Fourier, or what, what Poincaré was mentioning with regard to Fourier was the theory of heat conduction. In physics, uh, there's a very standard model that everybody that goes into advanced uh, uh, physics will cover, and that is uh, how does heat get conducted through a solid medium. And in deriving the equation that ultimately is known as the heat equation, you actually use the same theory that Bachelier applied to pricing warrants on the Paris Bourse. He gets what's known as a partial differential equation. Uh, and, and that's it right there. That's the equation that he used in his thesis. If you look at his thesis, you'll see it there. That's the heat equation. It's the same equation that explains the conduction of heat in a solid medium. But he derives it for the purpose of pricing this financial security. Now it turns out that there was one slight mistake that Bachelier made in his thesis. It was a mathematical error that uh, ultimately didn't really affect the results, but it became known. And when he came up for tenure, they wrote to all the various different big names. And he was ultimately turned down for tenure because they found this mistake. And uh, he was uh, blackballed, so he couldn't get a job except for uh, a small teaching college, uh, a women's teaching college in the south of France which uh, frankly sounds pretty good to me. So, uh, <laughs> but, but he, uh, <laughs> you know, for him, it was not, it was not, uh, it was not uh, the way he would not want to end his career. But at the end of his career, it was discovered that this mistake was not as serious, and people wrote him a letter saying, gee, you know, you're a great guy anyway. And uh, so he, uh, yeah, Paul Samuelson actually was the person who discovered Bachelier's thesis when he was uh, you know, in, in Paris at the Sorbonne reading through various different archives. So Paul Samuelson's responsible for resurrecting uh, the, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the reputation and the work of Louis Bachelier. You can see his thesis now. It's been republished uh, and reprinted. But the point of the thesis is that by assuming that the underlying stock price was a random walk, and by developing the mathematics of the random walk, he was then able to figure out what the price of an option was on that stock. And it turns out that the pricing of the option on the stock reduces to solving this heat equation. And that explains why there are nowadays so many physicists and mathematicians that are in finance. It's because the whole body of knowledge that comes along with the physical interpretation for the heat equation can be applied virtually identically and verbatim to the pricing of options and other derivative securities. And so very quickly, we can see that uh, the, the information that's contained uh, in these market prices can be understood within a mathematical framework that we know. So 
now going back to the history, it turns out that this was not known in the 1970s. It wasn't rediscovered by Paul Samuelson uh, until uh, later on. The, the folks that actually worked on option pricing, that tried to figure out the mathematical prices of options, uh, were quite a few. Uh, Kreuzinga, who was an MIT PhD student in the 1950s. Oh, question? No? OK. In the 1950s, there was an MIT PhD student of Paul Samuelson's who tried to work on this problem. And he actually has a thesis titled Put and Call Options of Theoretical and Market Analysis. It's actually in the MIT archives if you want to go take a look at it. But he didn't quite get it. He didn't get the right solution because he didn't have the mathematical machinery to be able to work out the final elements of it. Kay Sprenkel, uh, a student at Yale in 1961, wrote a thesis under Jim Tobin and Arthur Oaken uh, titled Warrant Prices as Indicators of Expectations and Preferences and tried to price it as well. But he wasn't able to come up with a, a pricing formula either. And there were a number of other attempts to try to come up with the appropriate pricing formula, including attempts by Samuelson in 65, where he had to make assumptions on individual preferences in order to get a price. Uh, that didn't work out. And then Samuelson and Merton in 69, they tried to come up with a pricing formula that was preference free, and they still couldn't do it. Along came Black and Scholes. Fisher Black, who was at, at that time was a consultant working at Arthur D. Little. He wasn't even an academic. Fisher Black, actually the, AD, the Arthur D. Little building, that's the building that uh, is right over there, the one that they won't let us tear down because it's supposed to be a, uh, an architectural gem of sorts. <laughs> that was the Arthur D. Little building. Fisher had his office there. Myron had his office in the next building over. Myron Scholes. And they started talking about option pricing. And Fisher uh, came up with an analysis that was very much along the lines of Bachelier. He basically got this formula, but he couldn't solve it because he had never heard of the heat equation. Because his background, Fisher Black's background, was in computer science, not in mathematics. It was ironic because Fisher Black actually had a PhD, not in economics or finance, but in applied math. But he had never taken physics. So he was, it was, he was doing discrete math. So he started talking to Myron Scholes. And as legend would have it, Myron took that heat equation, went over to the math department here, and asked one of the mathematics professors, yeah, have you ever seen this thing? And the math professor looked at it and said, oh, yeah, that's just a heat equation. Yeah, you solve it like this. <laughs> and, and so Myron apparently took it back to Fisher Black. And Fisher said, hmm, this is interesting. Uh, we can now write a paper. And they wrote a paper on this. At the same time, Bob Merton was working on another direction that was trying to come up with a solution. Ultimately, he came up with the same solution. They didn't know it because they had actually not communicated to each other. Uh, but ultimately, and you know, uh, Myron and uh, Fisher, they sent their paper to something like five economics journals. Every single one of them rejected the paper, saying this is too specialized, it's not really economics, it's not finance, we don't know what it is, but go away. <laughs> and it was only until they were able to change the title of the paper from option pricing to the pricing of options and corporate liabilities uh, that they finally, <laughs> so it was exactly this, uh, well, I'll show you next time. They, they changed it to, to start focusing more on a corporate finance. They ultimately got their paper published. It turns out that Merton used a very different approach, but got to the same point. And so Black and Scholes uh, got their paper ultimately accepted in the JPE. Merton got his paper accepted in the Bell Journal, both in the same year. In fact, Merton got his paper published first, but he argued that the paper should be delayed uh, because he wanted Fisher Black and Myron Scholes to have their paper come out in the same year. He felt that he derived so much intuition for what Black and Scholes were doing that he didn't want to get there first because it was not fair to them. That was one of the most extraordinary uh, acts of uh, professional ethics uh, in the uh, profession because it was pretty clear to both of them what was at stake. This was a, a huge problem that took an enormous amount of time to solve. And of course, the rest is history. Uh, they were awarded the Nobel Prize in 1997, um, uh, Myron and Bob. Unfortunately, Fisher Black had died of cancer the year before, but it was very clear in the Nobel address, uh, both on the participants' part as well as the Nobel Committee, that Black uh, should have received it as well. So that's the, uh, the history and the heritage of option pricing. You can see why uh, MIT is uh, rightly proud of it. 
And uh, given that we're out of time, let me stop here. And then next time, what we're going to do is to take up where we left off and focus on the actual pricing formula. I'm going to derive it for you, not the Black Scholes formula, but a simpler version. And you'll see it, uh, and you'll be able to take a look at it and play with it. We'll, we'll go on from there. Okay, I'll see you on Wednesday for the uh, midterm exam.